Okay. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Merkel. I am the Director of Graduate Recruiting and Admissions here at the University of San Francisco School of Management. And I would like to welcome all of you to the University of San Francisco this evening. 1855. Can anyone tell me the significance of that date? I would think maybe some of my students and alumni would know. All right! The year that the University of San Francisco was founded, actually just up the street from here, uh, Market Street, a couple blocks away, uh, it was established by three Italian Jesuits. Uh, I don't know their names, so I will read them. Uh, Reverend Anthony Moraschke, Reverend Joseph Bixio, and Reverend Michael Accolti. What about 1976? Anybody? Way to go. Okay. New York Apple, Apple was founded by three gentlemen. What were their names? Steve Jobs, Wozniak, and that mysterious third guy. Who's that? Ronald Wayne. Ronald Wayne. Okay. So we have more than a century separating these two institutions, right? So what, if anything, could they have in common? Anyone? I mean, we certainly know what they don't have in common, and that would be a stint on Dancing with the Stars. God bless Steve Wozniak. Uh, anybody? I just gave you one clue. They were all started by three gentlemen together. Uh, and if I may, I'd also like to say that uh, both USF and Apple have a long-standing tradition of excellence here in the Bay Area. Both believe in and strongly encourage innovation and an entrepreneurial spirit. And both hire uh, or recruit to hire and or enroll the most highly qualified individuals to become part of their community. I, of course, however, am not the Apple expert, so that's why our, our speaker is here this evening. Um, and so I'm definitely not the person that you're here to listen to, but if I may, for those of you that aren't familiar, I'd like to tell you a little bit uh, about the University of San Francisco Graduate School of Management. We offer eight unique graduate degrees. They range from analytics, business, finance, uh, information systems, nonprofit administration, public administration, organization development, to global entrepreneurial management. All of those programs, with the exception of the information systems program, are offered here at this facility at 101 Howard. And some of them are also offered at our campuses in Pleasanton, San Jose, and Sacramento. Through our programmatic offerings and curriculum, our school prides itself on educating uh, or striking a balance in education and educated for all three sectors, private, public, and nonprofit. My colleagues and I will be here throughout the evening. If any of you do have questions about the program or the school, we are more than thrilled to tell you about everything that is going on here. And if you're feeling a little shy and are not necessarily interested in having a conversation, we also have a table of materials that you can just grab and take for yourself, a family member, a friend, a colleague that you believe might benefit from graduate education here at the University of San Francisco. All of that said, I again would like to welcome you to the University of San Francisco and without further ado, introduce our speaker, Alejandro Ruelas Gossi. We are honored to welcome him this evening. Uh, Alejandro is a distinguished lecturer on strategy and has written numerous articles for Harvard Business School Publishing and the Financial Times. In 2007, Alejandro's concept of strategy orchestration was cited as Harvard Business Review's most recommended article. He has also lectured at countless Fortune 500 companies, as well as Oxford University in the UK, ESA in Spain, INSEAD in France, and UCLA Anderson. Alejandro holds an MS of Technology from MIT and a PhD in Strategy and Complexity Theory from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Please well, join me in welcoming Dr. Alejandro. Thank you very much.
watch this for the introduction. So let us see if this is everything here is working. Okay, so to, tonight I want to talk about a strategy and about the Apple of Steve Jobs. Um, of course, Tim Cook also. It's, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's like a movie we already watched. Because when uh, Steve Jobs left in 1985, you know, there was years of in inertia of success and then everything failed. So we're pretty much at the same time now. So I think it's, it's quite interesting. But anyway, so a strategy ultimate goal is about becoming the most admired company, the most viable company, the most innovative company. And all those things have been achieved by Apple and Steve Jobs. So perhaps the Apple company and the strategy is pretty much the same thing. So are becoming one. So if we want to to be that kind of amazing company, perhaps we can need to understand how they did it. So I've been studying Apple for many years, and I've been trying to go like inside the mind of a CEO, which is a very a little bit difficult, because it, this guy was a natural. And the concepts that he uses are very different than the concepts we learn in schools. That's where he was a dropout, as you know. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's quite interesting, the, uh, the life of this guy. So I'm going to try to to explain, I have identified five interesting, I think, insights. And I want to use the wording of, uh, of Susan Evans, and I want to thank you for the invitation. I think this was uh, wonderful to be here. And, uh, and I think the way you put it, genius business tax is actually the right word, and I'm going to use that. We're going to copy from that from you. I think that's a genius business tax, because it's kind of genius, what, what he did. Um, so I'm going to, to start, uh, if that's OK with you, with some of the some of children's classics. This is kind of like a working definition of a strategy. A strategy is about answering three questions. Where are you? Where do you want to go? How do you get there? So and you need to ask that question consistently pretty much every time, almost every day. A strategy is not something that you do once a year and then you try to implement. I think there is a false dichotomy between strategy and execution. You need to be strategizing all the time. So the first question and the third question is a matter of transpiration. I mean, of course they are relevant, but they are not that important. I mean, where are you is not that, is not that difficult. Of course, a little like open a Pandora box where you need to, to measure how the company is doing. And, and how to get there is also uh, transpiration. Of course, you need the people, you need the, pretty much the who and the hows. But the what and the whys are in the second question. Where do you want to go? And that question is, is uh, it's, it's very difficult. Because you can be working very well in the first and the third question, but if their second question is wrong, you will be failing. It's amazing to realize that, that before Steve Jobs took it over again in 1997, the company was very much almost in bankruptcy. So this guy, in, in some weeks and months, resurrected the company and became the most amazing company in history. So that means that you are going to invent a company in, in months. That means that everything he needed was already there. But the way he articulated that the, that's the whole difference. I don't know if, if I'm explaining myself, but the, the things were already there. So in some months, you are not going to change a company or, uh, you know, unless you have something different to direct the company. So this is the second question. So 
which way to take? And the question of the of the cat is, uh, who would you like to go to? Who would you like to place? What, if that place that you would like to go is going to define which path to follow. So perhaps it's, 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 it seems silly, but this is quite important because when they asked that question to Steve Jobs in 1995, the answer was so interesting and attracted my, my attention. Let, let's see what the answer. You know, ultimately it comes down to taste. It comes down to taste. It's, it comes down to trying to expose yourself to the best things that humans have done. Taste. Is that a material word? So the question was, how do you know you are going in the right direction? Okay, the second question is, 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 is about inspiration. It's about, it's not inspiration, it's, a, it's inspiration. And the answer is taste. So what is taste? So is that important to make double click in that, in that taste and try to understand what did he mean by that? The most interesting thing is that 12 years later, when they ask Bill Gates, if you could start over, and you could take one skill of a Steve Jobs, <coughs> what would you pick? You are in the front of the genius from the Lama Arabi, and you want to ask something about what you take from Steve Jobs. And the answer of Bill Gates, 12 years later. Well, I'd give a lot to have Steve's taste. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he has natural, uh, not a joke at all. I, I think in terms of intuitive taste, both for people and products. You know, we, we sat in Mac product reviews where there were questions about software choices, how things would be done that I view as an engineering question, you know, and, uh, and you know, that's just how my mind works. And I'd see Steve make the decision based on a sense of people and product that you know, it's even hard for me to explain. He, the way he does things, it, it's just different. Uh, and you know, I think it's, it's magical. Magical. Senses. So Bill Gates, pick exactly taste. So what is taste anyway? It's not a managerial war. It's, it's, it's not a language of a strategy. So perhaps I was going to say something about the advantage or something like perhaps that they come to that, that we know that some of them don't work. They are obsolete. And, and Bill Gates was interested in the days of Steve Jobs. So what is states anyway? So I think perhaps the only other that I found that it's really trying to catch that spirit of what Steve Jobs uh, was trying to intend. Until every idea we touch enhances each life it touches. You may rarely look at it, but you'll always feel it. This is our signature, and it means everything. Doge, feelings, enhanced life. I think this is the last ad of Apple that I found at least talking about days of the Steve Jobs. The rest are different today. They're spending millions and millions of dollars here in the US, in Western Europe, and there was in China in advertising apps, which is very, very strange. So taste, what is taste? So I'm trying to understand from the anthropological perspective, what is taste? What did he mean by that? So I was, I, I was finding, I think, very interesting things. I find something that you like is something that is very emotional, is lifestyle, is attractive, has high value, touches your, your feelings. And also I discover from the political perspective that is something related with surprise. Something that you like that goes to your emotion is something that is surprising you. Surprising you is very close to a gift. When I was doing the research for, uh, for this study of Apple, 
I was a, a, having a, a research team and they were interviewing people all around the, the world about what were the feelings. So very weird questions that I was asking. What were the feelings when you have an Apple product? And the, the, the common denominator was very interesting was I felt like I was opening a gift. So the box was very attractive, Sh it shined, and the people were very excited to open that box. It was like a gift, gift. So what is a gift anyway? You can have many things, but when somebody is going to give you a gift, it's very exciting. It makes you feel special. It makes you feel unique. When Steve Jobs said, everything comes down to taste, to be exposed to the best that human beings have done and incorporate that into a product. Wow. To the best that human beings have done. So I was trying to think, okay, what would be the way to understand this better? How can I think in something that perhaps contains that idea of uniqueness, of good, of surprise? I realized then that we are mesmerized by innovation concept, we are mesmerized by innovation thing, and everything is about innovation today, because innovation is precisely a surprise. Anthropologically speaking, innovation is something that is surprising you, that wasn't before. That's why it's so attractive. So, innovation is a surprise. Innovation is something that is, is trying to to make you unique. What is that? Do you recognize that? This is the lightsaber of a Jedi. I tried to come up with that. How can I explain the taste of Steve Jobs? And I was thinking in the Jedi. And I was thinking in this image. The picture of Steve Jobs having like a Jedi Sable, it wasn't that good in, in, uh, in, uh, in the pixels, so that's why I had this one, but there is a, a, a part where he was holding the iPhone. The iPhone is something that is making you power. This is the best successful, the most successful product in history. They invested 300 million dollars, and has earned billions of dollars. Makes you feel special, makes you feel powerful. Lots of anecdotes when he was designing. <coughs> so it's something that is that has to shine, that has to be totally unique. So the question is, and then after the iPad, the, sex, the second most successful product in history, business. So it's it's amazing. The, the, the two first are Apple, are the iPhone and the iPad. It was the iPad before, but now it's the iPhone. Have sold more iPhone than iPad now, so it, it's really um, and the, lots of anecdotes of, of the design. So, but the question is, how do we know that we are in the right direction? If the question of the right direction was taste, the question is, are we losing that taste? In the interviews I have been doing with the, my research team, one of the consensus was. It's becoming a me too company. It's becoming more normal, more normal. It's not a misfit anymore. I'm going to talk that in the, in the, in the fifth uh, inside of that. Um, let's try to let's see about what perhaps. <laughs> you see, the footprints vanish eventually. So how many years are we want to be enjoying the footprints? Tim Cook said in an interview with Charlie Rose that uh, his uh, Steve Jobs office is still there. But the demographics of Tim Cook operations are the same that Michael Spinder. Actually, it's like a copy of my, you know, Michael Spinder, 1993. He's the guy who almost destroyed Apple. He was coming from operations. So now the wars of efficiency is in Apple now. Apple was never efficient. Innovation is never efficient. 
So it's, it's kind of a, of, a, of very different variables today. So how do we know that uh, we are going to do the same thing? I, and I tried to, to, uh, to study what happened when Steve Jobs returned. What was the thing that he did that reinvented the organization? I mean, OK, everything was already there. The way he articulated was the difference. The way you strategize was, was the difference. Everything is there today, OK? So I'm going to mention some of the things that the, that, that Deep Cook is doing, and I, it's going like a red flag. So I'm not saying that it's going to fail at all. I'm not saying that. This is still, the numbers are still amazing. But the numbers were still amazing for six years after Steve Jobs left, was fired in 1985. So that doesn't tell us anything. But there are some red flags that I would like to elicit. The red flags, perhaps, in, in the apple, in the apple of today. So um, I was I was uh, re returning to this concept of the very successful campaign when Steve Jobs returned. You remember that campaign? Think different. Of course, success has lots of fathers. I have read lots of the stories about that campaign. And I'm trying to find like a mix of all the stories I've made because everyone was there, depending on who's writing the book. So, but, but if we try to understand and to separate all the different personalities in that the stories that are, are being told, we are right to, to do very interesting things. One is that there are two words. There is not one word. It's nothing differently. It's not an affair. And that is intentional. I talked with some of Steve Jobs' uh, former executives. I was going to bring one of them, but uh, I realized after some weeks talking to him that he didn't like Steve Jobs. <laughs> and I realized one of his was, oh, this is, this is, this is going wrong. So, uh, because I think that he, Steve Jobs didn't bring him to the new Apple. He was in the former Apple and, and in Next. So I realized I think this is not a good guy to, to bring. Because I found, my God, like a white and black we do talk to former executives of the Apple, it's amazing. So this guy was definitely a misfit. And now Apple is becoming more normal. So I'm going to question that, that at the end. What is normal? Anyway, so let's talk about think and different. So what is think and what is different? Different is a noun. And think is a verb. So it's not a one word, it's not think differently. Intentionally was think and different. Let's try to understand what, what, what was the, re the reason behind all this. First, think. What is think? The pragmatic understanding of think, according to Steve Jobs, was this one. We spend a lot of time on a few great things. Exactly. We spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of time on a few great things. Do you know what, what is happening today in Apple that um, spending a lot, a lot of time in a, on a few great things is not happening? Uh, I don't want to, to show the regressions here, but I, I studied the different updates on the products since Steve Jobs is not there, since he was very, very sick. And they are doing different things today. It's clear that iTunes was in touch for many years iTunes was in touch for, it started like seven years ago. And then perhaps that was the reason I didn't spend too much time in iTunes, that I didn't detect the technology of streaming, for example, the demographics idea of, of, of combining emotions with music, that wasn't detected. If you want to, to see what company is not thinking, Thinking is about taking time to imagine. But imagination, what is imagination anyway? Imagination is a dual process of converting money into knowledge and knowledge into money. That is imagination. If you don't have money, you cannot imagine. I'm sorry, but you cannot imagine. You need money to, to have in, in imagination. You need someone to sponsor you to think. Otherwise, you cannot think. If companies just being efficient, 
I mean, if you're spending your time in reducing cost, so you will find you will find problems. So what is what is thinking? Do you remember one part in history when people were sponsoring to think? What is come to mind? What is going to mind when you are thinking in that? You go to the Renaissance. You find in the Renaissance, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raffaello. Why? Because there were people who were sponsoring imagination, art and science. Medici family, Lorenzo il Magnifico, the Italian guy. Okay, like the founders of, uh, of U U USF. So this Italian guy, who was sponsoring to think. So let us see in history, when did we start to think? When was the first man who started to think? And let's compare it if we are thinking today. So let us go to 11,000 years ago. What happened 11,000 years ago? 11,000 years ago, there were hunters and gatherers. People didn't think. People spent the whole day trying to get food, either hunting or gathering. It wasn't easy. People were nomads. People were, were moving all the time until one day, one guy, I would like to, to have the name, perhaps, perhaps it was a woman, decided, I don't want to be nomad anymore. I'm going to till the soil. I'm exaggerating, of course, I'm making it simple. And I'm going to use farming animals. I remember you have read the work of Jared Diamond, Professor Diamond from UCLA. This guy is very This guy has a very interesting theory, which has, I think is accurate. He says that the advance in societies in the planet has been related with farming animals. He said that in, in, the, in the portion of Europe, Western Europe to, all, to pretty much middle, middle Asia, in that part of the planet, in the same, pretty much the same temperature, the same latitude, in that part there were 11 of the 12 farming animals. One farming animal was in America, just one, and there was one in Africa. So he said that the reason of advancement, or the difference in advancement, is because farming animals. Why is that? Of course, they took farming animals to Australia and New Zealand, because perhaps you are asking, what about Australia and New Zealand? They took them there. They brought them to America. We didn't have those animals here. So what is the thing with farming animals? Is that the, we didn't have to spend all our time looking for food. And the extra time but you having the animals organized and living in the same place, not going everywhere, not being nomads anymore. The, the rest of the time that you had, you started to think and to imagine a different kind of world. And you would say, of course, that is obvious. You need to think, you need to imagine. That is obvious. But you know something? When you see what is happening today, we just see this. We have a virus in the world today, sameness. Every company is imitating everyone. So if, if we, I don't know if you have studied this technological progress in the last 100 years. I did. The most amazing decade of technological progress in the last 100 years, actually 150 years to be more exact, since the, since the enlightenment until today. You know what decade is that one? What is the decade with the most advanced and with the most amazing technological pace in the history of the last 150 years? The 60s. Everything we use today was pretty much invented in the 60s. Remember the Jetsons, the cartoon, Hannah and Barbera? Remember the war that they were describing in that one? That never happened. Remember Back to the Future? Remember when was the future? Remember which day was the future in that movie? April 2013, last year. MIT calculated the time well, all those things in science fiction were going to be real. What's going to be in the 90s? What happened in the planet then? Why the last two decades? And if you didn't know this, you need to, you need to have more information. I'm very happy to share with you. 
for technological progress indicators, the last 20 years in the world has been the, the slowest in technological pace in the history of the 150 years. If you think that technology is going fast, you need more information. It's not going fast. We were talking with Roger before about that the planes have the same velocity. You, you was going to be Concorde? Not anymore. We will have to have just one phone number everywhere with Iridium, Motorola. Not anymore. And I can tell you 10 or 15 cases that the, the, the speed was amazingly good, I mean, in the, in the late 80s, and then something collapsed. What was the collapse? The collapse of communism. What happened with communism? What communism affected us that much? Because for many years, until 1989, there were two planets in the same planet. They did not coexist. Everything is about numbers. It's about the, the Malthusian equation. It was like two point something in the first world, capitalism, and two point one something in the, in the second world, communism. The third world was the on the side. 20th century was about convincing the on the side. Korea, Afghanistan, and, uh, and Vietnam conflicts. What about to convince on the side to be first or second? Korea is the most salient one of that. You can see Korea today. It's exactly the, that example. What happened after the collapse of communism? You know, unfortunately, there was a fever of integration. 1986, the GATT was signed, the General Agreement of Tariffs. So people were very excited to be integrated. Europe was being integrated. And then with that was the collapse. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, from Stanford, he's in Stanford now, Francis Fukuyama, wrote the famous book, The End of History, saying the history is over. The capitalism won. So we were welcoming in the same planet in just a snap of fingers, more than two billion people. That unfortunately, what I'm going to say, I know it's very, very hard, I know it. But the only thing they brought was mouths to feed. So the war of want collapses with the war of need. I mean, the G7, geopolitically speaking, they have solved poverty. And we're supposed to be in that track. But then, more than two million people jump into the same planet. What has happened with that? I'm not going to talk about organized crime because I don't want to, to go into, into more trouble. But I want to talk about arbitrage and offshoring. Unfortunately, the only way to participate in this new planet of this collision was by having offshoring facilities in the poorest places in the planet to manufacture cheaper. And then the role of those guys was, unfortunately, the very cheap labor. And we have China, of course, there. And we have all the events of the war of need collapsing with, with the war of want. And we have that today. It's, this is, of, of course, when I'm doing this here, this is the, the iPhone, 2007. And then I don't want to put any brand here, of course. I don't want to talk specific about brands. But this is pretty much what is happening now. So you look at lots of companies that are doing exactly the same. And this Z generation, the guys who were born in the 90s, is everything that they have sold since they were born. For them, it's normal to imitate, to copy. In August 24, 2012, not very far away from here, they fell in favor of Apple, thanks God. Why? Otherwise, copying and imitation would be permitted by law. So and imitation is something that is affecting a lot. Why? Why the time to imagine is being reduced Drastically. Let me give you some, some, uh, some ideas. Okay. Uh, China and different places in the world, but mostly China because of the very large population, they are pretty much doing this thing and imitating, of course, products, technology from different parts of the developing world, and they are selling them cheaper. But you know something that everywhere in the world they are buying them. So you are, for example, in France, and you have to buy a specific machine of something, and you have, to, you have the German one and you have the Chinese. 
Chinese is amazingly good also, but the price of that Chinese fare is half, 10%. So the directors of purchasing everywhere in the world, what, what they do? They buy the Chinese one. So China started to grow a lot, like crazy, because they were selling. So what happened with the sales in the developing world? It started to be decreased. So the imagination thing, money into knowledge, knowledge into money, is being reduced. So people are not investing in basic research anymore. Tell me five places where they invest in basic research. You, you won't find them. It's just applied research. We don't discover, we don't discover anything. Basic research is amazing, but who is sponsoring basic research? So the money to invest in more R&D, the money to invest in time to think, the money to invest in imagination is being reduced. And then because of, of buying those machines, those technology, from the very cheap labor countries, no, I'm not talking about offshoring here, I'm talking about the imitation of machines, reverse engineering. Uh, they were selling pretty much the same, with the same function, but very, very cheap. So eventually, the guys who were buying those, that stuff, of course, good machines, don't, don't take me wrong, but the technology, the next generation of technology of the company that was stolen is being reduced also. So it's compromised the technology base. So, how do we know if a company is thinking or not? Let me give you some symptoms. If you look at a company that is going to low cost programs, cost reduction programs, or efficiency programs, you know for sure that the company doesn't know where to go. The second question, no idea. They're trying to go on with the same thing they have been doing, but they're trying to be efficient. Second point. When you see a company that is acquiring, purchasing, and then on the pole of acquisitions, I was so scared when I read this book saying, we are on the pole of acquisitions. Oh my god. I mean, acquiring bids? Please. Why that happen? Bids, the company, the, the earphones, I think, the um, streaming? That, you know, if, if we wait, look at the things that, the, that the, uh, Steve Jobs said about it, you will find, I want to, to re return to that, but I would like- We're not trying to do a lot of this stuff, because it's not what we do. We don't think one company can do everything. So you've got to partner with people that are really good at stuff. Like, we're not, I mean, maybe Microsoft is, is great at search. We're not, we're not trying to be great at search, so we partner with people that are great at search. And uh, we don't know how to do maps on the back end. We know how to do a great, the best maps client in the world, but we don't know how to do the back end. So we partner with people that know how to do the back end. And what we want to do is be that, uh, that consumer's device and that consumer's experience wrapped around all this information and, and, and things we can deliver to them in a wonderful user interface, in a coherent product. And so in some cases, you know, we have to do more work than others. You know, in the case of, of, of iTunes, there wasn't a music delivery service that was any good. We had to do one, so we'll do one. But in other cases, there's companies doing a way better job because we're not as, as good at this stuff as other people are, and we love to partner with them. And so, you know, we selectively do that. And um, I think it's, it's really hard for one company to do everything. I think that gives you a very interesting hint. If we read the declarations of Steve Cook today, it's pretty much the opposite to this. Very much the opposite to this. There are many things that you have to do. But le let me let me go, go here to the, the, the <coughs> third insight. So I'm talking about we talk about taste and then think. And we now talk about different. And let me touch a, a strategy principle that nobody's question. That the um, Strength and weakness, it sounds familiar? You know, I think everyone is related with a strength and weakness idea. No? And of course, it's a threat, the SWOT paradigm. Okay. What is different anyway? Let me be a little bit philosophical here, okay? So be, be, bear with me. A strength and weaknesses, okay. I have the strengths and I have the weaknesses. 
The recipe in that methodology says that you have to improve your weaknesses. Okay? Okay. If every company is improving their weaknesses, what is going to happen in the mid-term and long-term? That every company is actually the same. So we go to the same as okay. The idea of improving the weaknesses is wrong. Why? Why this is wrong? Not just you are duplicating resources, but human beings are different in nature. And the firms that are managed by, by, uh, by human beings are being pretty much the same thing because they are improving their weaknesses. What we just heard from Steve Jobs was the opposite. He said, we are very good in this and we are strengthening that. We went for iTunes because there wasn't a good system. That's why we did it. They didn't improve it, of course. That's why Spotify and Beats emerged. Because they abandoned the thinking in iTunes. That, that's so obvious. They didn't change a bit in, in iTunes. So they didn't spend a lot of time on a few great things. They are spending in many things now. So different, imagine this. So you have a strength and weaknesses. So rather than improving, so you try to improve your weaknesses, and then the strengths are here. The idea is forget about weaknesses. Let me give you a, a very important news. Weaknesses, they don't improve. So weaknesses is you need to partner it. So Steve Jobs said, we partner for those things. We are not improving our weaknesses. We, are, we don't care about that. So let me go uh, very economic now. Uh, Brian Arthur, professor at Stanford came up with a very interesting concept, which is called positive feedbacks in, in economy. Positive feedbacks in economy means that uh, you are going, if, if everyone is strengthened, the strength, everyone is going to do his or her best. So his or her best means that everyone is performing at the level of the strength. So it's going to be more harmony. When people are improving their weaknesses, companies are being the same thing. Look, look at, uh, at the word at oh, what's saying. I think there'll be stories like that that come and go, but focus is about saying no. And the result of that focus is going to be some really great products where the total is much greater than the sum of the parts. He was asked a question after he just took over Apple. And they asked him questions about projects that they were running in Apple, and they were, what happened with this one? Because there were lots of products that were there. And I still just said, focusing is about saying no. It's not saying yes, it's about saying no. And he eliminated a bunch of products. And at first, people said, this guy is wrong. We know that became the most valuable company in history. So it's about saying no, it's not about saying yes. So what happens, so what is, the, what is the feeling here? So what do you have to do then? So what do you have to do if, uh, if you want to, to really change the game? So we go to this, this is the, the, the fourth concept that I would like for you to consider, orchestration. Did you know that 100 years ago we didn't have orchestra conductors? The music has been there for centuries, but orchestra conductors just 100 years ago. Did you know that? So for some reason, or no reason, somebody said, it would be a good idea to have an orchestra conductor. You know, they have very beautiful instruments all around. Beautiful, you have a partiture, but you know, perhaps we need some way to organize. And then we have, six hundred years ago, orchestra conductors. I think that is happening to management today. Manager is a position for the 20th century. Manager is, is coming inside the organization. Orchestra conductor is managing outside. This guy has been the most amazing orchestra conductor in the, in the history of business, Steve Jobs. He convinced everyone to play his game. He engaged them. There are 900 million, not, I'm sorry, 9 million registered developers in Apple today. And hotels, cars, speakers, Everyone was playing the Apple game. 
But you know, for doing this, we need to go to a new economic foundation. I don't know if you have thought about this, but the economic foundation behind the egocentric fear, I mean, the fear that has to create value based in just the individual fear, is based on the 18th century, Adam Smith, maximizing earnings, being egocentric. Most strategic theory is egocentric. The dominant, the two dominant uh, research streams in the strategy are the industry structure and the resource-based view. Both are egocentric. Both are about the fear. Both are about maximizing earnings. This guy, natural, because I don't know if he knew about it. I don't have the, the question to answer. He read a lot of philosophy, I, I, I know that. But in terms of economics, he was doing something for the 20th century. Nobel Prize in Economics, 1994, who remembers that? 1994, Nobel, Nobel Prize in Economics. Game theory. John Nash. John Nash came with a very unique idea of Nash equilibrium. Mathematically, spe mathematically speaking, Nash equilibrium means minimizing losses. That sounds weird, no? Because we are really with maximizing earnings. But by minimizing losses, we are allowing everyone, every player, to have their best. Not to improve their weaknesses, but to play with the best of everyone. So we're talking about game theory here. We're talking about orchestrating the best of the best. We're talking about incorporating, if you look at, the, at, the, at every Apple product in the Steve Jobs era, was a platform. When he was incorporating the value of many people, he met millionaires like Angry Birds, like uh, like uh, La Chazam, every you know all the other that you know. He didn't care about it because it was about minimizing losses. It's so funny and so awkward when you see that one of the first moments of Tim Cook was to get rid of Google Maps. He had to apologize because the mind of Tim Cook, trust me, is egocentric. He even declared some weeks some weeks ago. You can look at New York Times, you can look at everyone, I declare, we are the only company who can do all those things. So. Welcome to the Macintosh Software Dating Game. Software CEOs, could I please ask you to introduce yourselves? Hi, Fred Gibbons, President of Software Publishing Corporation. Hi, I'm Mitch K. Poor, president of Lotus. We do a product called One, Two, Three. My name is Bill Gates. I'm chairman of Microsoft. Okay, so who's the winner? Apples are red, IBM's blue. If Mac's gonna be the third milestone, I need all of you. This is 1984. This is how having clear since that time. He didn't want to beat anyone. He didn't care about it. He wanted to play with everyone. It's amazing. When he returned in 1997, the first thing he did, you remember well, was to go with Bill Gates. Bill, please design Microsoft Office or Mac. In that interview I showed with Bill Gates and, and, and Steve Jobs, it's, it's beautiful the way he described Steve Jobs in this one when, uh, when they asked him, Okay, you guys have invented pretty much the digital world. I mean, more people, of course, like Mitch Caper, all those things that uh, you were mentioned. But you are the most important ones. Okay, so um, what, what about you guys? What could you say about you two? And then Steve Jobs said, I'd like to explain life with music from the Beatles of Bob Dylan. And I could say that the things we have been doing together are more important than the uh, long uh, way we have come from. And then the interviewer said, the, the interview is finished because this is, this is beautiful. So these guys were, I don't know they were precisely the best friends, but they worked together since that time. So Apple didn't want to beat anyone. Maximizing earnings, a 10th century idea is beat your competitor. And this guy was about engage them to play your game. So this is a dramatic change. 
the, we call this in a strategy allocentrism. Egocentrism is, you know, just one player that wants to, to maximize earnings individually. And allocentric from the Greek allos, others, I want to play with everyone. I mean, ecosystem, the kind of ecosystem is a game that you want the others to play with you. So it's about, so a strategy is about changing the game, not beating your competitor. Your competitor has kids to feed as well. So the competition idea, metaphor of war, is bad. Even sports is bad. Because even sports is just one gold medal. Nobody wins the silver medal. They lost the, the, the gold medal. Silver is losing the gold. So those metaphors don't work for business. Because that, that is, uh, are forcing us to be competitive, uh, to beat competitors. Here is, if everyone is maximizing what they do, what they excel to, we will have the best of the best. But now, because of the proven weaknesses, we have mediocre companies all around the world. And that's why we need to, to go in the, into the sameness virus, which is all over the world. The idea of Black Friday, you know the, the history of Black Friday? It was a very bad day. Selling cheap, what you invest, good money. It was a very bad news. The world is imitating that, and they were converting that into a modus operandi. All the riots of Walmart guys saying, you are selling very cheap because you are paying us very cheap also. The average salary in the US has been decreased because of this low cost virus. And the world is full of this sameness and low cost. Steve Jobs was precisely the opposite. Steve Jobs wasn't low cost at all, never. It's the most expensive product still, and it's the most valuable company. So we are something wrong here. We believe that being efficient and being productive and having the lowest cost is a good strategy. It's not. It's, it's totally mistaken. So if we see, there is the world of digital today. I'm trying to make it simple, of course, here. I love the hummingbird because it's a very unique, very different animal. I love it. He even flies back. And I try to describe here, in a very simple way, the digital world today. This is devices, hardware, operating systems, the brain. I put the body, I just said the devices, and then operating systems is the brain. Apple was the only company, actually, it's very interesting. When you ask Steve Jobs about his company, he said, we are a software company. He always said, we are a software company. But we need the devices to make it happen. So but the brain is the most important part. The, the, the body is the, the devices. But what about the wings? The apps? You don't need to be in the apps. You need to really have updates in everything about devices and about operating systems. But apps? Do you know how many millions is Tim Cook spending today in advertising health? Actually, you want to eliminate an app, you cannot. So now it's going for application, because he said that. We are in the three things, applications, operating systems, and devices. What is going to happen? You won't have enough time to think in everything you did before. I'm, I don't know if you like the iPhone 6, but uh, it doesn't shine anymore. It looks more plastic now. It's not glass. So it's different. It's like uh, the Galaxy 2012. So it's, you know, some of the interviews people said, mostly in the US, that I'm into company. So because they are spending time in, in, in many things. But not just that. Let me, let me go before uh, organizing this uh, island, because every island is beautiful, but every island is connected. So you need to orchestrate everything. It's amazing. You, you started with orchestrating. Perhaps you remember when the, when the iPod was launched. Lots of people around, even Madonna and Eric Clapton, everyone was very happy because this guy was a magician to orchestrate his own game. Business-wise, it wasn't really profitable to design Microsoft Office for Mac, less than 1% of the market. But he convinced, because in that time, Bill Gates was still very egocentric. Eventually, he changed. 
But he said, I won. Bill Gates jumped in Microsoft Office for Mac because he said, I won. And Steve Jobs didn't care about that. In, in that interview, Apple was selling 60, 60 billion and Microsoft 86. Now it's almost 200 billion. And Microsoft is just 80 billion. I mean, it just, of course, it's a lot. But I'm saying that that, that that growth is amazing. So that's why it's important to, to listen to, to this guy. So, but now let's go to the fifth inside. And I'm almost finished. The fifth inside I like to call power. Power. If I were to find one rabbit, I'd ask the bad hatter. The bad hatter? No, no, I don't know. Oh, the long hair in that direction. Oh, that's fancy. I think I'll put it here. Of course. He's in that too. But I don't want to go among bad people. Oh, you can't help that. Most everyone is mad here. <laughs> mad people all around. You cannot help it. Pretty much everyone is mad around here. So you want to have a comfort company to work with? You want to have that wonderful climate to work with? I think you are you are in the wrong planet. So you need to work with with, with the paradox. What do I mean by with the paradox. So let us see what is the way Steve Jobs described the good organizational climate, the good, the good environment in the, in, in the firm. And that's always been, in my mind, my metaphor for a team working really hard on something they're passionate about, is, is that it's through the team, through that group of incredibly talented people bumping up against each other, having arguments, having fights sometimes, making some noise. And working together, they polish each other. And they polish the ideas. And what comes out of this really beautiful stones. He was given the example that the, uh, a guy who lived in, in his same street when he was a kid. This guy is a, a, an old guy, and he took him to, to his home and explained that they, you can you have rubbish, lots of stones, friction, abrasion. It's going to be polished, it's going to be beautiful. He learned that since very early age. He understood that. Bill Gates said before, remember, he had a very good taste for picking people. He was picking the best. And those best people sometimes are very difficult to deal with. My people. You need to, to, be, to play with, with, the, with the paradox. Of course, you know who this guy is. This is one of the sad stories I have seen in my life. You know who this guy is? He's a genius. This is called Forstal. This is the guy who designed iOS, the best operating system ever. He was the best, one of the best lieutenants of Steve Jobs. What happened when Steve Jobs died? Tim Cook fired him. Because he was very combative. He, he liked to fight. So you want to have a very comfortable organization, everyone is happy, forget about creativity. Dorothy Leon, a professor at Harvard, who has a wonderful book with the sparse fly, talks about um, abrasion. Professor Robert Sutton from Stanford said, hire the guys who do didn't like in the interview. Do you need abrasion? Because pretty much, as the cat says, everyone is mad around here. So you need to have just nice people in the organization to be a wonderful company. Like, uh, they say that Apple is beautiful now. So forget about creativity. Abrasion is very important. The paradox that I want to mean is chaos versus stability. What I want to, to pick, chaos or stability? You need both. Running versus reinventing. Because now Tim Cook is running a firm. Running is managing, 20th century. Reinventing is strategizing. It's changing all the time. Do you remember September 2008? What happened in September 2008? The collapse of the first world. I already talked about the collapse of companies. The capitalism also collapsed in 2008, September. What did Steve Jobs do? It's amazing. The launching of, of iPhone has been uh, just a year before, I'm sorry. A year before was the launching of the iPhone. You know what he did? 
he accelerated the launching of the iPod Touch. Why? Because he knew that the iPhone, because of most of the iPhone is paid by the carrier, but you need to sign a contract, the sales were going to be decreasing, of course. He launched, accelerated the launching of the iPod Touch and put a Skype. So you can make a phone call without committing to any carrier with the Skype. Now we have lots of Reptel and Viber, etc. because of that movement. Because strategizing is, a, is your own, it's a bear. It's not, oh, that's a very bad thing, you know, let's hope what happened. No, he knew that something was going to happen. He made changes all the time. December 2008, the best sales ever in Apple because of the Apple Touch with the Skype, not because of the iPhone. So running an operation is easy. Reinventing an organization is strategizing. So it's the paradox of game. Running versus reinventing. I was talking one of the former examples of Apple that I wanted to bring another guy. And then he told me, and then I said, okay, I think we'll have to talk more. Thanks very much for your time. He said, you cannot innovate all the time. What? When somebody says that, it's dangerous. You innovate as long as you are spending time in something. Because spending time in something is you have imagination. When you stop thinking, you stop imagining. You stop, you stop innovating. Innovation is a result of imagination. Imagination is about money to knowledge and knowledge to money. So when somebody said, no, you need to, he, he told me, you need to understand. You know, you cannot innovate all the time. Who says that? And I ask him, why don't you go to, to uh, newspapers of the 60s? I did that. Please do it, if you don't believe. Go to the newspapers of the 60s. And you will find the amazing number of innovations every week. But now, the only company we were waiting for was Apple. And the rest was just observing and imitating. The Z generation thinks that this is that's life. 60s was very different. Because we stopped thinking. We stopped managing. Do you know, they said that this guy was a horrible guy, very combative. Do you know what is he's doing today? I just checked yesterday for okay. me. you know what is he's doing today? Philanthropy. But they are very fearful in Apple that perhaps he's going to come with a company of this own. This guy is a genius. A Stanford graduate. Um, working Apple for many years with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs knew for sure that this guy was a very difficult guy to deal with. But that is diversity. We love diversity here. We need to accept diversity also in humor. Some of the smartest people in the world are very difficult to deal with. But you're going to fire those guys to have a wonderful organization on the climate? You know, something normal is overrated. You know, you want to be normal? That is exactly what you don't want to be. What you don't have to be, you know, Jobs was talking about misfits, crazy ones. Now everyone is nice in Apple. Everyone is nice in Apple today. For Steve Jobs was everything different. I, I saw uh, one of the last uh, presentations of Steve Jobs. I was almost crying when he was so sick. Well, some weeks before dying, he was presenting the building for his people. That is uh, perhaps delayed like three years, unfortunately. They're supposed to move on to 2012. And he said, everything is different here. Different was a noun for Steve Jobs. And now you're becoming a Me Too company, very large company. You are enjoying perhaps the footprints still. But are you in the right direction? And. Uh, this is the last concept that I would just to leave. Remember that concept? That concept was uh, said by, by, by Steve Jobs, perhaps you remember, in the commencement Stanford 2005 speech. The best invention of life is dead. So what is the paradox about? Fear versus comfort. Life versus death. Reinventing versus running. 
Chaos versus stability. We need to be able to deal with both. Because the vegetation of life is dead. Unfortunately, he died, but uh, he, this is very, very sad. But, uh, um, so this is the, the five things that I would like to, to, uh, to give time for questions. This is the five concepts that we will discuss. Phase, think, different orchestration, paradox. I think we have time for questions. OK. Yes? Why the IO6-5 uh, six could not get into any of the leadership role? He was an inventor and was reporting to Steve Jobs. Is it because of his personality he yes. could not manage a big team and could not be in the leadership role? Yes, they said, the excuse that they said is the combativeness. And they asked him to, uh, to say that he was the guy behind of the map's failure. Which he never wanted to sign that because I think that's lying. But the, that's the reason that they were, it was a, a, there were a bunch of guys like this, and Steve Jobs knew about it. He knew that. But he loved the abrasion. We, you just heard. He loved the abrasion. You heard it. So that's why I wanted to bring the videos for, for you to believe what I'm saying, because this is Steve Jobs, the guys who was saying that since the beginning. I mean, this guy has had everything that natural. I don't know if he was able to transmit what he thought about that. I think not really. Yes? I'm curious as to what your thoughts are about how a company like Apple, as it grows, can preserve some of that culture of innovation and how it can not become a meeting company and still grow and build out processes and such a way. So what do I think uh, if, if you can um, uh, remain a very generated company? Right. I think that's the five things that I think you, you, need, you, you need to have. I mean, I think that the, uh, um, I think that the qu question is good because if you if you try to understand, for example, the uh, the I covered all those five things because I think those five things are the ones after studying Apple, and I wanted to find non-intuitive insights. So who is talking about taste? Nobody says anything about taste, but for uh, Steve Jobs, that was the most important thing. So I think that, that those five concepts, I, and I've been trying to to test these ideas in other companies, and I have tested with some executives this thing, this uh, uh, separate concepts, of course, not the five, the five, the five together, um, not, but some of the concepts, and, and people are, are, are um, seeing that they can apply. You can apply this to your, your organization. Of course, you need to get rid of some of the Sunday concepts that you know, for example, low cost. Forget about that. The strength of weaknesses, forget about that. Opportunities and threats, threats, just the language is affecting you, threats. There's no threats, there's just opportunities. The threat of September 2008, still just converted that into an opportunity by accelerating the development of the IP of Touch. But I would advise you to, to follow those five principles that I'm realizing that, that, that the Apple of today, I see is not following. Of course, the time will tell, but this is the right timing to, to, to ask. Thank you. Yes. Do you have an organization that you think is on the right path to follow these five principles? Maybe the next Apple in your mind? Yes, no one. No, not even Google. Google, for example, I don't know if you have read the, the last things that Larry Page was declaring. was really pathetic. This guy had lots of money and they had been doing lots of things. And this guy said in Financial Times, Steve Jobs advised me all the time not to go for so many things. So uh, I visit Google every year. I come to teach here in this area every year. And then I go to Google every year. So I've been observing Google the time. And Google, they don't have any idea where to go. The right direction, no idea. They are trying to bet it on everything. They have lots of money to do it. They even have something that they, a new post, I don't know if you have heard. Captain of the Moonshots. Have you heard that one? So the moonshot is supposed to be a wonderful thing because every human being has needs to have a moonshot. So they are trying to so it's 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 kind of betting on everything, which is good in, in, a, in a way because you have lots of money. Billions of cash that unfortunately Google is not using. Which is, is wrong. You know, I would love for example that they have updated the MacBook Air that you have there. Or this is Pro that this one. This is the MacBook Air. How many years have been the same, the man Five years. Five years! Could you believe it? I just switched last week to the Microsoft Windows Surface Pro 3. I, so, I feel so sad. 
Because this, you cannot touch the screen, you cannot separate. So what is happening? They are not spending a lot of time on our favorite things. They are not. They are trying to go for applications, which is exactly the thing that you don't have to do. Apps, please. Apps. So you are the expert in health now? So you are a hospital or you are? So why health now? Check the prime time spending of ads of the health app in Apple. And it's not just here. It's also in Europe and in, Ch in China. Millions and millions of dollars are spending in an app. I think you have to concentrate in the beauty, in the taste of devices and operating systems. Yes? If, if no one's innovating and everyone is just copying and everything's the same, what's the end game? Where do you think we're going to be in 20 years if it's going on? <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit uh, eschatological if you allow me to. I think the phenomenon, the phenomenon of indignados, you know, that Spanish word that they started to riots all around the world, I think it's going to, to happen in, in many places. I, unfortunately, I don't see that people are abandoning that idea of, of, uh, of, of low costs. People are, if you look at the average salaries, even, I don't know if you know, since 1850, there's a person with economics we call the hockey stick in economics. Until 1850, the income per capita was pretty much the same. 1850 switch. We are the first generation, the Z, the Z generation, that is going to have lower income per capita in the developing world since 1850. Kenneth Arrow, Nobel Prize in Economics, said that. He showed the numbers. So that's why. I, I, I want to, to call the attention to start thinking of it. But there is no money, unfortunately. Okay, okay, there is money. I don't know if you, if you are aware of the, of the work of Thomas Piketty, uh, economist in France. Paul Krugman, another president of economics, said that this is the best study in 10 years. So people are upset. Do you know what he said? He said essentially that the rate of return of capital is higher than the rate of growth. So he's saying essentially the trickle down economics that, that means. I'm going to reduce the taxes to the wealthy to spend in, in jobs that was for many years working. It's not working anymore. People are just sending that money to Switzerland and somewhere uh, uh, paradise, fiscal paradise. You know the size of the bank sector is 12 times the one in 1929 where the Great Depression was? So return are, is bigger than growth. So what was his solution? It's horrible. So you want to get a solution? charge 80% of taxes to the wealthy. Robin Hood, that wasn't born yet. But in Europe, is very exciting that in Europe, they want to do that. Some countries like Germany, I'm sorry, not North Europe, like Scandinavia, is more 65%. Now. So this guy is proposing a to balance. Do you know that, um, this, this is really scary, that 85 people in the planet have 60% of the wealth in the world? 85 people in the world. So it's not 1%, not even 0.1, it's 0.00001%. So the money is there. So what do we have to do? And you know what I did? I was studying crisis for the last thousand years. I was trying to read all the crises, and I found something 400 years ago. You know what the solution was? If you're interested, go to Google and Google the fable of peace. It was written by a, a guy from the Netherlands who lived in the UK for many years. When, when the, this guy died, Adam Smith was 10 years old. Just for giving you an idea, when was this thing? Fable of peace. The concept in, in, in current terms is private vices, public benefits. Perhaps you have heard of that. What is private is a wonderful strategy. You know what that means? If you go, for example, to, to the, and I'm Mexican, so I can tell them. Lots of Mexicans are crossing the border to the US for the American dream. And I know, I know that is wrong, but they are starving there, so it's horrible. You go to Europe, and you have the same problem. From Africa, going to Italy, going to France. So the world of need is invading the world of one. But in the world of one, there is lots of world of need now. 40 million in poverty line here in the US now. So. The idea of coming here is not the solution. What would be the idea of private versus public benefits? Let me give you a Colombian example and a New Zealand example. Colombian example. They're supposed to sell the best coffee in the world. So rather than selling the coffee very cheap, 
try to enhance, enhance the value taste. And try to sell to exotic guys that are going to love like a most expensive coffee. I don't know if you have seen the program National Geographic, pathetic program. Don't tell my mom I'm in Moscow. Have you seen that program? Don't, don't, don't watch it. I was in China, I didn't have anything to watch. I was in the machine in the gym, and then, oh my God, it's the only thing in English, so let them see. So I want It's the eccentricity of the billionaires in Russia. You cannot believe it, but they are trying. So there are lots of billionaires all around the world, lots of Russian billionaires, which is a little weird because 25 years of private property, so I don't know how that, that is happening. Lots of billionaires in China as well. We're talking with, uh, with one of the Koreans uh, here, that he was, she was telling me that the size of the population in Korea is pretty much the millionaires now in China. So we need to be able to sell to those guys products in that world of need, but enhance. I don't know if I'm explaining myself, because you see that. They just have cows. Cows, yes, and they have in the same land of Argentina. These guys realize that cows are wonderful and they are selling the most expensive cows in the world. They're not making an iPhone, no, just cows. With that, they have almost the income per capita of the US. How do they do it? Because they double click many times cow and they realize that they can sell the very expensive cheeses, boutiques of cheeses. The largest number of boutiques, cheese boutiques in the world is in New Zealand. They found out um, incoming FBI for the direct investment of biotech that the milk has applications for medicine. Serum from the milk. So they are double click what they have there. I call that the vantage point. Stevia is the best uh, sweetener. In the, the only one that, that doesn't affect other things is in Paraguay. Paraguayans, they are not selling, they could sell the best, uh, you see? Chile, they have copper. They sell the less expensive copper to China. Why don't you sell the most expensive copper and try to, you see my point? So rather than trying to look for your future in a country that is having problems, try to enhance what the nature gave you and try to sell by a better price and try to balance. Robin Hood was taking the money from the wealthy people. The idea is to sell them to the wealthy people. And that was the solution 400 years ago. And it worked by Bernard Mandelow. And the war is pride, vices, public value. So they last tried to balance. Because, and what is happening to your fortune? Okay, you need to work in the iPhone industry. Yeah, okay, you want to, to do it. And Foxconn is going to assemble. Do you know how much money of the $850 of an iPhone? You know how much money is having Foxconn? $8, less than 1%. You will never be out of poverty with that thing. Because now the, the, the global chain of things is the poor people are assembling and the intelligent people are supposed to be designing. But that is not happening. So it's 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 so complicated. I have been with the with the with the bankers talking about those things, the bankers of, of worldwide. And after the presentation, I remember one of them, the, the, uh, the CEO of BBVA, one of the largest banks in the world, a Spanish bank, told me, we know this, but nobody's going to do anything. So it's, it's kind of scary, but, but what, what I, my advice is that the poor countries need to realize where are they and do the, exactly the same thing that New Zealand did. Okay, I think that's it. I think we are more the time of that. Thank you very much for your, for your attention.